It's Sarah Burke here, and I've got one more episode of the Women in Media podcast for you to wrap up the year that was 2023. While most of my work is in podcasting these days, I am still doing a radio show, which I love so much, on Indie 88 in Toronto. I'm not sure how much I've talked about the Sunday show on this podcast, but it's Sundays from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. And the goal really is to get great Canadian songwriters who don't get enough airplay alongside great international songwriters in the same playlist. It really is a quest to get musicians who are making music that doesn't quite fit in a box into your ears. And if there's anyone who has really followed that journey with her career after years of being scrutinized in the spotlight and trusting her path slow and steady, it is songwriter, producer, musician, feminist, and activist Margot Price. And I want you to know ahead of hearing this interview that she wasn't feeling the most amazing, but she was kind enough to spend a little time with me, although she had been back and forth to the clinic at home in Nashville. But we did look back on the year together and talk about the two records she put out this year, Strays and Strays 2. Here's my conversation with Marco Price. Last week, we were going to have a little chat and you were at the clinic. I feel like everyone's sick right now. Everything okay? My whole family's been sick and uh, now... My husband, Jeremy, has it. So it's been a really long week, but it's just that time of year. Yeah. And I'm glad I'm sick now. So then I have to tour in in January. So I'm just getting it over while I'm I'm home. Well, thank you for still doing this. I appreciate it so much. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's been a couple years since you and I have chatted. And I feel like, you know, the last time that we talked, you were in the creation of this next chapter that you're now living. A lot of people are saying it was the year of Taylor Swift. I think it was the year of Margot Price. I've been loving your audiobook. And for anyone who's not familiar, it's called Maybe We'll Make It. And I think in listening to that, I didn't really realize how long ago you were actually producing, not just singing, not just writing. Like you've always been somebody tinkering around with all the tech and stuff too. So this year there was more production in your life. How has that all played out for you? been great i love being in the studio i would spend all my time there if it uh paid like it used to but you know unfortunately we all got to go out and dog it on the road but it's been incredible i actually this whole week i've been in the studio with an artist named cam i've been producing her record and oh cool yeah it's it's something that i just really love to do i i like to give my opinion and i like to (laughs) To boss people are going wrong. <laughs> so yeah, it turns out it's a it's a good seat for me to be in. I caught you at a Toronto show this year. Um, it felt like you were definitely more in charge of everything going on artistically, including that show we saw on stage. You like waltzing on in your sequent bodysuits, and I've I love this new era of Margot Price. Like you just kind of let go. Thank you. Yeah, it's been really freeing to just uh, reinvent myself and yeah. kind of shatter expectations of what people might have might have had of me. Yeah, it's been cool to watch. So just looking back on the year, because this interview is mid-December, what's your proudest moment of the year? Oh my goodness. I think Willie's 90th birthday celebration was a lot of fun. I had so much fun just getting to, you know, pay tribute to him. He's become like family to me and feel pretty, pretty blessed to be in his orbit. I also have really enjoyed being at Farm Aid and, you know, being able to kind of put my heart into the work and help family farmers. It's, you know, something that is obviously close to my past and, and how I grew up. Those moments are are some of the dearest. Yeah. What's like a, maybe like a Willie lesson that he's passed on to you? Oh my goodness. Well, I have like a hundred dirty jokes. And, <laughs> <laughs> um, but just really the way that he, that he lives his life. One of his quotes that's really stuck with me is like, when I started counting my blessings, my whole life turned around and, and, you know, he's been through the ringer with, managers and was not being accepted in the Nashville establishment. And then, you know, seeing him at, at 40 really get his career off the ground. That to me has just been so incredibly inspiring. And and also, of course, the way that he, um, you know, put away the booze and and was really transparent about, you know, leaning on weed and, and trying to destigmatize that. 
I've really tried to do the same with, um, you know, my openness about psychedelics and, and what psilocybin has given me and the ways that it's enriched my life. Because I think that there's just so much shame and, and stigma around that. Yet here we glorify, um, you know, alcohol and its culture. So it's been, um, it's been really empowering to just, yeah, be able to be myself and yeah. Well, psilocybin led to both the records that you put out this year. So talk to me about that and Strays. It was a trip to South Carolina, right? Yeah, starting on a trip to South Carolina and the band and I went out to California and spent a ton of time in the studio with Jonathan Wilson, who I've just admired his work for so long. And he really knew how to bring out the best in my band and really you know, put a emphasis on the songwriting and he was willing to follow me down any road that we wanted to go down. Um, but it was, it was nice to just shake things up because I think, you know, you can really get stuck in the same patterns of, of thought and in creating the same way. And I just wanted to be able to write about anything and to also like paint with as many different palettes as I wanted. I didn't want to have to be limited by genre or subject matter. And um, yeah, it was just, it was a really freeing experience. Do you have like a a moment where you knew psilocybin was going to be so helpful to you? Like, was there a light bulb moment with it? I think, you know, we had been, Jeremy and I had been cooped up during the pandemic and he had COVID so bad that he went to the ER. Oh, shit. Two times, he was sick for months and months. And um, actually, we really we credit Fiona Prine for giving us some medicines and some things that uh, really helped him finally get over it. Because this was before the vaccine or anything. Yeah. And um, you know, we just knew that we needed a trip. It had been a really long time since I had had a psychedelic trip. And so we kind of just brought them down just like as a like medicinal tool just to help us through everything that had really went down over those couple years of my career finally took off, but then I got pregnant and I had to take a bunch of time off the road. And then after COVID and everything, it was like, all right, we need to just think outside the box, get outside of our head a little bit and I actually, I have photos of the the night that we took the mushrooms and the, the one that I took, it was a huge mushroom and it was shaped like an owl. <laughs> it, just had, it was so weird and it was like blue and purple and white and all, oh, it was so scary looking. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, I'm just going to eat this whole thing and, and see what happens. And Goodbye. Yeah. We, uh, we were laughing and crying and just going through all the emotions and, uh, and back in those days, I was still drinking too. So really writing those songs, they were fueled by tequila and <laughs> weed and all the things. Yeah. I, was, I think it was like Mezcal Mules was kind of where I was at at that point too. <laughs> yeah. So it was, you know, it's like when you hear about like Neil Young going in for the like tonight's the night session or whatever. It wasn't just psilocybin. It was everything but the kitchen sink. Do you think psilocybin brought you to like the sober moment? Absolutely. Hmm. I am. Um, you know, during 2020, I had very little purpose because I wasn't touring and I wasn't able to connect with my fans and and friends. And I was just, you know, going through being a new mother again. And I was barely sleeping and having a lot of postpartum depression. And it was absolutely like fueling myself and just trying to like trying to reach a point where I felt okay and, you know. Or felt something. Yeah, yeah. I really was was in that phase and I knew that I wanted to take a break. And so I just had this night where I was sitting outside with uh, my sister and her ex-husband and and Jeremy and we all were sitting out there and I, I took like a, a God's dose and I just kind of went into that trip. I didn't even tell anyone around me, but I was just, I had read all about how Bill Wilson, who was the founder of AA, how he had just kind of been treating people early on with acid and it was curing 
there were alcohol abuse. And so I went into it with that thought. And then it was just like a light bulb kind of clicked. My therapist actually just got properly certified with both cannabis and psilocybin. So she's like going to be trying all sorts of really interesting things in the new year with her clients. I'm excited. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's just so many incredible tools that are out there. And if people were just kind of more open. Yeah. I think it's, you know, the pharmaceutical company has our nuts in a vice, so <laughs> they don't really want anyone to know, like, the secret of, yeah. you know, instead of sleeping pills, you can just use some magnesium, and instead of... Uh, Smoking an old joint. Being on antidepressants, absolutely. Yeah. It's like, just take a weed milk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Where, where did strays, like the word strays, which is obviously such a prominent piece of all the art this year, where did that come from? Well, it started with the song kind of started as a poem and I sent it to Jeremy and it was just about our life and our coming up together. And um, it's on Strays too. There's a song called Strays. And so that was where it came from. And then it ended up that that song didn't make the first cut. Yeah, why? I just, we had too many good songs. And I, I don't think that, um, I don't think people have the capacity to listen to a double album. I think we live in such a like True. Yeah. 15 second culture that and also it's just really expensive to press a double album i wanted to keep things affordable for my fans i didn't want to be like okay this is a, you know a 35 40 dollar record yeah and i knew that you know if i spaced it out i could give equal amounts of attention to both cool and actually listening to the audiobook too i feel like i get the strays thing more than i did just listening to the music i feel like they need to be kind of consumed together if that makes sense yeah yeah that was definitely the intention yeah was like all right i'll kind of put these out and they ended up influencing each other a lot because you know i was mixing the album writing the album while i was also going back through and like editing 500 pages of my memoir which i had wrote i started writing it when i was pregnant and that took about four years to come to fruition. Yeah. And so then it would be like, I would be titles for the chapters. And then I would be writing these songs. And I'd be like, oh, this song was actually kind of fits to be this title. So there's little Easter eggs in there. And the, and the little excerpts of music too. It's very cool the way you did it. What about collaborators? I feel like you've had so many collaborators this year. I obviously want to hear about Mike Campbell from Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, but you know, like on this record, Sharon Van Etten. Let's talk about that track radio for a second, then we'll get into Mike Campbell. Oh my goodness. I love Sharon. Her sound is so distinct and what she's built. I just admire her so much as an artist, as a writer. Um, We became friends at Newport Folk Festival And she was just, had just become a new mother. And I looked over side stage and she was there holding her baby, watching my set. I think this had to be in maybe 2017 or something. And so we exchanged numbers. And as I was kind of coming into the writing process, I just, I felt like I was like ripping her off somehow on that song. And so I just sent it to her and was (laughs) like, will you help me co-write this? Because I adore you so much. And she just stacked all these incredible harmonies on it. And she helped me with a couple of really key lines that, um, that you were stuck on. That I, yeah, I knew needed to be changed. And so she was just uh, like a lifeline for me, really. And we've, I've been so lucky to, to become her friend and, and just to have yeah. her to reach out to and bounce ideas off of. Yeah. Okay. And then Mike Campbell, I feel like you guys have always been buds. Was it hard to be like, hey, come play on my record? <laughs> oh my goodness, it was really so bizarre how it happened because he had asked Jeremy, my husband, to come out and open some some dates for him on his tour. And my record label, Loma Vista, they had wanted me to co-write with people other than Jeremy. <laughs> You're like, and well, I, fine. <laughs> I know, I'm like, well, you know, we just have this really intimate thing going and it's like, for me, co-writing is, it is intimate. You have to know somebody or or at least, you know, respect their art to do it. I don't want to sit down and just, you know, co-write a song with somebody just because they have a hit on the country charts or something. Yeah, yeah. It's actually quite the opposite. So um, my manager, Amy, she had 
been talking to Mike's manager and she just was like, Hey, would Mike ever want to write a song with Margo? And she kind of asked him before she even asked me. And then, you know, Mike really doesn't co-write with a lot of people and he doesn't even really play on a lot of people's I records. Know. He's pretty particular about what he chooses to be involved with. And when he said yes, she goes, Hey, like, would you like to write a song with Mike Campbell? And I'm like, Well, duh, we've been like <laughs> ripping off the Heartbreakers <laughs> for years now. So yeah, we went over to his house and um it just instantly felt such a, a kinship with him. And and there were, you know, I brought him uh this song Unoriginal Sin and and this other song called Malibu. And especially with Unoriginal Sin, it was definitely had like a petty vibe to it and the way that he showed me how to open up the chorus and I, I don't know if he, they have such a formula. And so it was kind of like a license for me to just be like, okay, yeah, we're definitely pulling from the heartbreakers and there's no shame in it oh, because course, they were yeah. some of the best songwriters ever. Yeah. He really has such like a warm aura to him. Even like I interviewed him in this type of digital space. And by the end of the interview, he was like, when we're in Toronto, you're going to come on stage with us. And I was like, no, I'm not. <laughs> this is not <Yes>. happening. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you are. Yeah. He's he is just uh such an incredible soul. Yeah. I love like just asking him about, you know, what it was like to work with Bob Dylan or like George Harrison. Yeah. Uh just really getting to like pick his brain because he's such a he's such a low key genius. Yeah. The Daily Show. I wanted to make sure that we talked about this. I loved what you did with the song Lydia. And I mean that's you putting a song about body autonomy and women's rights in the spotlight. During a time when people with strong opinions are getting torn down everywhere. Yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, we live in a time um, in the digital age where people are just so reactive yeah. and so divided. I mean, like America is just, you know, politically, it's very polarizing. And, yeah. you know, living in a red state where we just have the most laxed gun laws and then the most just terrible laws regarding what women can do with their bodies. I just, I can't, uh, I can't be idle. You can't keep quiet. Yeah. And, you know, obviously it's come with a cost. Um, it really truly has. And, and that performance, I, I thought, you know, it was going to be controversial enough, but then just regarding the, uh, Palestine Israel conflict that's going on. Yeah. Because of some things that um, Sarah had said and done. Oh, yeah. Sarah Silverman was guest hosting. I really got, um, I got a lot of unwanted feedback, we'll call it. Yeah. Very hateful comments. People saying, you know, I'm a white supremacist by association with a associated. And yeah, it was, it was really, um, it was a really tough month for me because it was, you know, I'm, I'm used to getting a lot of hate from the right, but I got a lot of hate from the left and, uh, it's been, it's been pretty difficult. Not gonna lie. Yeah. Um, I've been struggling through all that too. Um, over the last little while, it's been really hard for me to show up online. Like, and I live a pretty public life just like you do with radio podcast stuff and Jewish person. And, you know, you can believe in two things at the same time, I think is the concept that no one seems to understand right now. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I've said so many things before in my art where I've, uh, like, all American made, where I say, like, um, 1987, and I didn't know it then, Reagan was selling weapons to the leaders of Iran, but it won't be the first time and it won't be the end. They were all American made. And obviously, I don't agree that, you know, President Biden should be using our money to bomb this country that's majority children. It's terrible. Of course. But I also don't want people, if, you know, and then it's like, if I say ceasefire, then people are going to say that I hate Jewish people. And it's like, you, you can't absolutely win. can't win. I'm here to listen. I don't have to make a comment on every single yeah. thing. And I also don't need to be a mouthpiece for people. And it's really, it's really hard to live up to everybody's expectations. But I, I really just, of course, I want peace. Of course, I want the bombing to stop. Of course, I want that. Of course. And... It's really hard to be a highly sensitive person and to be in the limelight. It's just a difficult place to be in. But yeah. I, I hope people know that I am coming from a place of love. Yeah, that's all you can remind people, right? I feel so much of what you're saying. And it's like that acceptance that we have to find in ourselves to know that like someone will always be unimpressed. Someone always, no matter what you say. I know. And especially just, you know, I think 
it's so easy for people to not like women. And yeah. I am used to being um, to being a punching bag on the internet, and it it takes its toll. I have to take a lot of breaks, and um, I have to just not read the comments. And you've made a career of that, literally, though. Protect myself, yeah, yeah, because I'm just a human, also. God, yeah, people like when they see anyone on any sort of like pedestal, whether it be music, entertainment, whatever. It's a lot. Um, Okay, so back to praising your art for the year. I'm wondering if there's a song on the record that maybe hasn't given you an opportunity to tell a story that you maybe really wanted to share. See, there's a song on on Strays 2 that's called Black Wolf Blues, and I'm just so proud of chords and uh, the poetry in the lyrics and... And that was one of the ones that I wrote in South Carolina that just was really um, kind of the story of my grandparents, but it also just goes back to the battle for good and evil. Hmm. And um, Give it another listen. Yeah. I'm like, get that one a spin because I don't think anyone else is playing. Oh, it. <laughs> I love a challenge. <laughs> I feel like I know your grandparents from the audiobook now. I feel like I know Jeremy. It's, it's wild. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for listening to it. It's been keeping me company over the last few months. We'll put it that way. I like putting on an audio book before bed, like while I'm getting ready for bed. It gets me in a kind of relaxed zone. So, same, same. What are you listening to right now? Um, Let's see. What have I been reading recently? Well, I think this last week I just was so sick. I haven't been doing too much of anything. Yeah. But, um, I mean, Lucinda Williams' book was one of my favorite this year. And I just started reading this. Patsy Klein book that I did the forward to is called Letters from Patsy. It was so honored that I got to write about her because she lived such a incredible life and and really gave so many of us that got their start in the country music world. I mean, she she knocked down doors. She was wearing trousers when it was absolutely unacceptable to do so. Yeah. And I think, you know, a lot of people really she rubbed them the wrong way because she drank and smoked and cussed and and just lived this life that most people could only dream of. And then also, I mean, I, going back and, and reading about her history and hearing about how, you know, she'd been in a, a terrible accident when she recorded Crazy and she had all these wild surgeries. Um, oh, man, she just really inspires me. So I should tell everybody to go pick that book up. I'll put a link in the show notes. How's that? Awesome. Well, thank you so much for the time. I hope you feel better. Thank you so much. I'm uh, currently taking like a bunch of meds. Edible and Neo Citrin. That's my favorite. Oh, nice. Yes. Ah, yeah, I have, uh, I've, I've taken a little pause on my normal just like hitting my vape pen because I was just so congested and yeah, got to get my voice back into fighting shape here for the upcoming. Yeah. What do we need to know about 2024? Anything planned for Canada yet? Oh my goodness. I cannot wait to get back there. I just, I love your country so much and I wish that uh, the U.S. could take a couple cues from, (laughs) you know, the healthcare system and the legalization of weed and gun control. So many things. Um, I can't wait to get back up there. Right now I'm going to Mexico and the U.K. and Ireland, but you know I'll be back up your way. We know it. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'll be back mid-January with new episodes featuring Jessica Morehouse. She is a fellow podcast host, a money expert, and an accredited financial counselor. And I thought she'd have some wise words for us to wrap up 2023 and tackle 2024 from a financial perspective, a topic I'm finding many women are actually a little bit intimidated by. Let's get over that. And Joanna Roman, you may know her better as Jojo Roman. She's that celebrity tattoo artist I mentioned a few episodes back. She is a partner with Chronic Inc., a tattoo shop that started here in Toronto and has expanded internationally. And some health problems have put her on a new path. She is the founder and head designer of Chronic House, which she will tell us more about in the new year. So happy holidays. Thank you so much for being along for another year of the Women in Media podcast. Signing off for 2023, I'm Sarah Burke. Thanks so much for listening.